Greetings, and thanks for tuning in today. Do you sometimes feel like the world is spinning out of control? Don't, don't tell me what you think you're supposed to say. Tell me what you really feel. What you really feel in, in your gut, in the light of the unprecedented moral and cultural collapse that we're experiencing as a nation. You know, we're truly through the looking glass as everything is turned upside down in society. I'm starting to not recognize my country anymore. We're told that what we've always known to be true isn't anymore. The deficits are good. Soaring inflation and supply line problems are transitory, and the spiraling fuel costs are necessary to transition us into an economy most of us don't want anyway. On top of that, the self-proclaimed follow the science folks can't even define what a woman is anymore and are telling us that men can get pregnant. You can't make this stuff up. Add to the mix a compliant press and censorious social media platforms and you got a recipe for disaster. We are so far down the rabbit hole it makes me wonder if we'll ever climb back out to at least some semblance of normal. So looking at what's around us and what's happening can make us lose our hope. The writer of Psalm 73 had concerns about the shenanigans of his time foisted then as now by people who don't have a faith relationship with the God of the universe. And here's how he was able to navigate the nonsense and keep his inner calm intact. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. Wow. We need that kind of perspective today, friend. So I want to invite you into the sanctuary of God's Word with me as we study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, and as we remember that God is in control of everything. Let's pray before we enter. And again, Father God, we thank you that we can do this. We thank you that we can come before you with bowed heads and with expectant hearts. We thank you, Father God, that we can come knowing that you will meet with us. You will hear us when we pray. You will speak to us through your word, through the Spirit's illumination of the text. And I pray, Father God, that these things would happen today. We need this. Today we need a word from you, and you've provided it. So help us to make application. Help us to uh, live a life you've called us to live. Uh, in a more effective way. And, Father, I would ask for a more comforting way. Help us, Father, to be calm in chaos because of what we learn today from your wonderful word. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I see a, a couple of truths here. First of all, right now, God is restraining evil. That's the first thing we see in verses 6 and 7. You see, as bad as it is today, it would be far worse if it wasn't for the active restraint of God on the worst impulses of sin's depravity. That's right, you heard me. Sin's ultimate manifestation is yet to come. And you're not going to want to be here when it comes, I assure you. The arrival of the Antichrist that we talked about last week will reveal the depths of wickedness in a way that mankind has never experienced before. Look at verses 6 and 7 with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Paul continues to appeal to knowledge that his readers already have. But he changes the time frame from what will be, in verses 2 and 4, to what was true then and is true now, to be honest, in the next verses here, uh, 6 and 7. Sin is being restrained. He says, you know this, you know the restrainer, this is what is happening right now. Now, there's been some disagreement about the identity of the restrainer through the years, but the Thessalonians knew. Come on, can we be honest? We know too, don't we? Only God can restrain evil. Think about that. Only God can restrain evil. He may use things like law and government or even the church to hold it back, but God, specifically the third person of the Trinity, is the restrainer. In the sixth verse, the Holy Spirit is referred to as both power and person. Power, because it says we know what restrains, and then person, because it says he restrains, the personal, masculine 
pronoun. That's because the word for spirit is in the neuter, but as I mentioned, the Holy Spirit is mentioned um, consistently in the New Testament with, a, with personhood as he and his. Here's an example from the Gospel of John. I'm going to emphasize the words he, because this is just one verse. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Pretty definitive, wouldn't you say? And way back in Genesis 6-3, it was the Spirit who was restraining sin in the days of Noah. That makes sense because the New Testament informs us that it is the Holy Spirit's job to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And when natural man rebels against God, it is the Holy Spirit that he is turning against. As Stephen told the unbelievers in his day, just before they stoned him to death for his faith, he said this, You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. It's Acts 7.51. So he says that, that the, the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, the resister is sinful man. And this makes sense as well because according to scripture, unbelievers are children of the greatest resister of the ages, Satan himself. Listen to what Jesus said in John 8.44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But thankfully, the devil isn't all-powerful, and he's not in charge. Amen. He needs to get God's permission to afflict mankind, just as he did, if you remember, with the Old Testament character Job. So the Antichrist will be revealed in his own time. That's what it says here in verse 6, that he may be revealed in his own time. The person being revealed is the Antichrist. And so this is not talking about Christ and the revelation that comes later. The context, all the verses here leading up to this 4, 5, 6, and so on are talking about the, the, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, um, the Antichrist. And so he will be revealed, and it says, in his own time. But because the action is in the passive voice, it's something that will be done by God. Make no mistake about it, this will be done on God's timetable and according to God's plan and only with God's permission. He will not reveal himself, he will be revealed. Do you see that there? What precedes this manifestation of the man of sin will be the removal of the Holy Spirit, who the Father will take out of the way so that the real character of evil will show through. Now, this doesn't mean that the Spirit of God will cease to be present because he is omnipresent, he's God. There's, there's no place where God isn't. Psalm 139 talks about that, right? But his role will change. His work of restraining will change, but his work of remaining continues, okay? So he's still remaining, he's just not restraining. Does that make sense? Now, by the way, I, I no longer think this holding back will occur with the snatching away of the church at the rapture. I used to believe that because the Holy Spirit indwells us as members of Christ. But that event, the, the, the rapture, happens just before the tribulation begins. And this revealing of the Antichrist in his true colors is, is halfway through, or three and a half years in. So, and it, that makes sense. Even before, it, it wasn't the church that was restraining. It was the Holy Spirit in the church. So I believe that it's talking about the Holy Spirit here. Um, it will not be synonymous with the rapture, but it will be three and a half years later, and then the Spirit of God will cease holding back, and God will give, Romans 1, will give man over to his depraved mind, and, and so on, to do those things that are not pleasing and not, uh, not proper. Now, in verse 3, we were introduced to the man of lawlessness. Remember, uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day will not come until the falling away comes first. And the man of sin, we talked about the, the, the man of lawlessness, is revealed, the son of perdition. So we talked about that in verse 3. In verse 7, we just read about something called the mystery of lawlessness. So the man of lawlessness will be reviewed in the, revealed in the future. But the mystery of lawlessness, he says, is already at work. It was then and it is now. Now, we've talked about this before, but let me remind you that a mystery in Scripture is a divine truth once kept secret by God, but now revealed to his faithful. 
It's a divine truth, once kept secret by God, but now revealed to his faithful. The word occurs 28 times in the New Testament, all but seven from the pen of the Apostle Paul. And I want you to see that it is impossible for unbelievers to understand these truths. It, it is not determined by a, by a degree from college. It is not found out by cleverness and, and education or intelligence. These things cannot be known to man unless God reveals them, and God reveals them to his own. So they are incomprehensible to the world. They are foolishness. They are beyond the pale, <laughs> which explains a lot in life, by the way, because so many of the things that we rejoice in as Christians and the world calls foolish, well, it's because they don't understand. They, they've been blinded by the devil. They can't see the truth. It's a mystery to them, no longer to us, because God has revealed them by his Spirit, as we'll look at in a few verses uh, in just a moment. In fact, let's do that now. Um, the Bible says, Paul tells the Corinthians, that natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's 1 Corinthians 2.14. But then he also says, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. <clears throat> Here's an example. The world thinks that man is inherently good. Uh, they used to say, good and getting better. We know that's not true. The world is shocked by sins in humanity. Genuine believers recognize it as the rotten fruit of our shared depravity. We hate it. We as much and more hate it because we know that the devil is behind it. But we aren't shocked by it when, when sinful people do sinful things. That, that shouldn't shock the, the people of God. Because that's what they are by nature. That's what we were by nature until Christ found us and saved us, delivered us. So the world thinks that this life is all there is and that we can solve all our challenges if we think a little better and, to be honest, throw some more money at it. But that's not going to help. They are ignorant of these spiritual battles being waged all around them because they don't have the spirit. No spirit, no spirituality. The Bible describes their wisdom in James as being earthly, sensual and demonic. It is characterized like everything else in their lives by envy, self-seeking, confusion, and every evil thing. My Bible tells me that we have the mind of Christ. And so we can be spiritually discerning. We can see the things. The mystery of lawlessness has been revealed to us. So listen, friends. The basis of racism, homicide, sex trafficking, injustice, uh, illicit drugs, shootings, and every other form of violence and every other form of evil known to man, the basis of that is sin. It's not a particular political party. It's not a personality. It's not a policy. It is sin. And the only solution is personal faith in Jesus Christ. Now, unbelievers would say what I just said was hokey. Christians know that it's holy, it's truth. It's based on what God gives us in his wonderful word. So it's bad, all right, but it's going to get much, much worse. But I want you to know, and Paul's reason for, for explaining and writing here is so that, that, that you and I would be comforted, as the Thessalonians were, by the fact that in the midst of it all, God is in control. Here's the second truth. Okay? The first one is that, that right now, uh, today, God is restraining evil. The second point is that someday God will repay evil. Now, we've talked about that some. He will repay evil, verses 8 through 12, gets us back to the future. Let me read those verses for you. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's an important point. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So we're back to the future here, and he says that once the Spirit stops holding back evil, once the restrainer stops restraining, the second half of the tribulation, called the Great Tribulation, 
and not because it's better, but because it's worse, will begin. And that will end 1260 days later when Christ returns in power and glory, as we've been seeing all along in the letter. He'll, he'll come back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who know not Christ and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This includes a man of lawlessness, who these verses tell us the Lord will consume or annihilate with the breath of his mouth and destroy, or render inoperative, with the bright appearance of his coming. Just by showing up, by his appearing, by the breath of his mouth. He will do this. You know, the breath of God is always depicted as something powerful and mighty. Here, in fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah, it will be a weapon of war. That's right. At the height of Antichrist's power, when he seems to be unstoppable, Daniel says, his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. <clears throat> the Old Testament prophets foretold this. The future will fulfill this, just the way God said just when God wants it to happen. <clears throat> Here are a few more details about this event that we take from Revelation, the last book in the Bible. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. But we see here that God will not just judge the man, he will judge the masses. And the reason is found in the final verses of the passage I've chosen, what I just read for you. Satan, the great deceiver, will be, have been using what verse 9 calls signs and lying wonders to bolster the Antichrist and to lead people astray. These will include tricks like falsifying his own death and resurrection, as well as actual displays of his power, because it talks about these signs and lying wonders, but also says with all power. So there is there are things that Satan can do in his power, and he will pull out all the stops and use all the tricks, and the result will be um, that the people of the earth will marvel at and follow the beast. Listen to Revelation 13. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. That's Revelation 13, verses 12 through 14. You see how it's all tied together with the Old Testament, with the church age, with Revelation, the end of the age. And we are able to see these and put them side by side, compare spiritual things with spiritual, and we're able to see what is going to happen, because everything that God has said would happen to this date has happened. The things that have not happened yet are still ahead of us and still part of his eternal plan. Now, these people that we're talking about in Revelation 13 and the ones that will be judged, um, the vengeance taken upon, are unbelievers as defined in verse 10 by those who did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. Listen, unbelief is the only reason for any person going to hell, for any person being judged eternally. It is because of their own unbelief. And that's what we see here. They did not receive the love of the truth so that they might be saved. And because of their unrepentant hearts, Verse 11 picks up, God will seal their fate by sending them a deluding influence so that they will continue to believe what is false. And verse 12 says, and then therefore be condemned because they did not believe the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so because they do not want to retain God in their, in their knowledge, in their understanding, in their mind, as we saw in Romans chapter 1, God gives them over to this delusion. He allows them to destroy themselves. He allows them the thing they said they always wanted, the freedom from Him, from righteousness, from holiness. God gives them what they wanted. And it ends up not the way that they planned. Yes, my friends, even as we head deeper into the rabbit hole of Satan's absurd alternative universe, we have the promise of the one who is really in control, that truth will win out 
and all the wrongs of this life will be put to right. Which leads us with one more comforting truth. Right now, God is restraining evil. Someday, God will repay evil. But ultimately, God will remove evil entirely. Isn't that amazing? Ultimately, God will remove evil entirely. After the tribulation is complete and the thousand-year millennial reign, there will be a, a great white throne judgment, and the devil and the unredeemed of all the ages will be thrown into the lake of fire where they will live in torment forever. Revelation 21 verse 8 describes their end this way. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderous, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's where all unredeemed, unrepentant sinners will go. And here's how the same chapter, Revelation 21, later describes the heavenly city Jerusalem that will be the saints' eternal home. He says there, But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Isaiah agrees, he says, only the redeemed will walk there. Sin's curse will be removed, there will be no night, because all the former things have passed away. Not only will you not want to sin, you won't be able to sin, because there will be no sin. Sin will be gone from the universe. Christ will reign forever and ever, and we at his side. This is the future of all who trust in Christ for salvation. And I trust, oh my friend, I trust that that is your future. If not, make things right with the Lord now while you can. And rejoice with our message today. God is in control. May God bless you as you take that truth to heart today, tomorrow, and every day until we see you again. Bye-bye.